Ding dong, Richard Arnold is gone and two major Manchester United figures expected to leave with him this week. Richard Arnold is gone and has to hand over control with immediate effect. We knew this was coming. We've been talking about Richard Arnold being sacked even way before we knew we were getting Ratcliffe because of the whole Greenwood situation that went down so badly. But Richard Arnold is gone Two more set to go, confirmed by Sky, confirmed by the BBC and confirmed by The Athletic. So, who else will be leaving with Richard Arnold? Who's coming in to replace Richard Arnold as the interim? Is he any good? And who is coming in in the long term in Blanc? Why is he a very good placement for Richard Arnold? Among a few other stories going about, United of the Jal Nevers, Sancho Tenark having to make up, we will get into all of the news. But of course, let's get this opening news story up on the screen for you guys as well. And let me know your thoughts. So it was said here, breaking Richard Arnold is to leave the club by the end of the year. An announcement will be made later today and will come shortly before Surgeon Ratcliffe and Ineos Sport concert, <coughs> confirm the acquisition of a 25% stake in the club. So basically, Ineos are coming in, Arnold's going out, Arnold's going to be leaving Manchester United within the next month or so. But a lot more was said if we if we just scroll out down here. Um, the United stand also mentioned that Richard Arnold is expected to leave by the end of the year. And we've also got news that Blanc, the former Juventus chief who left his high banking role at Paris Saint-Germain last December um, to oversee the entire Vinny Sport portfolio, is considered the main replacement for Richard Arnold. So let's get into the news. Let's deep dive into the news. Then we'll get into your opinion. <coughs> and then I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about Blanc and who else is expected to be sacked this week because some major major changes are happening inside United breaking Richard Arnold is to leave Manchester United by the end of the year an announcement will be made later today and this will come shortly before Ratcliffe announced shortly before Surgeon Ratcliffe's 25% stake in United is, is announced uh, Mike Mark Kleiman of Sky then said that Patrick Stewart Manchester United's general consul will be named interim CEO in addition to his existing role Richard Arnold's departure will come after a year of uncertainty about the club's future ownership with an announcement from the front expected and guess what it's now been announced that Richard Arnold has been sacked I mean some people were saying oh it's unexpected but I think we've known for a while that Richard Arnold was going to be sacked it's been announced by the Athletic it's been announced by Simon Stone it's been announced by many sources that Richard Arnold will be sacked in fact we know that Patrick Stewart is coming in but the Athletic have come out and said that John claude Blanc is under consideration to replace Richard Arnold on a permanent basis and the Athletic also said that we're expected to make further changes so what else was said by the Athletic in terms of further changes oh that's the wrong screen what else was said by the Athletic in terms of further changes that are expected to be made at Manchester United and who is the Arnold replacement so it was said here, Surgeon Ratcliffe is expected to make further changes <coughs> after his minority stake is ratified. And Sir David Brailsford, formerly the director of, <coughs> the man, uh, of the British Cycling, is set for a key role with him and Ratcliffe also weighing out options for a sporting director appointment. Essentially, from what I've been told, from what the reliable sources are saying, Arnold, bish, bash, bosh, ding, bong, he's gone. Boom. Bye bye, Arnold. Blanc is coming in unless something goes wrong there, but it, it's basically expected the Blanc will come in. Murta, don't be smiling. You're going with your best bud, Arnold. No more trips to Barcelona on the beers when you say you're getting the young. Murta is also going with Arnold. And Paul Mitchell is expected to come in very, very soon ahead of the January window. And then after Murta goes, and then and then after Paul Mitchell comes in, Harrison is expected to be gone with Sir David Brailsford coming in to Manchester United. Three major changes. A competency is the most. Hopefully, recruitment execs uh, changed out next. Yeah, recruitment, basically, there's going to be like loads of major sackings. Harrison, um, Murta, Arnold, recruitment coaches medical team apparently the whole shabam is just going to go on at united sacking 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 major sacking this major sacking that there's going to be lots of big things happening at manchester united which is is mad uh, the whole sorry situation will go on for years while the glazers still own the club well the glazers should be out of the club for three years and the glazers no longer have sporting control but 100 percent get your point as well um honestly i don't know i need to do i need to do research on on, on the brailsford row as well um, look, we've got to talk about this. We've got to talk about why this is good. We've got to talk about all of the news. So do quickly hit that like button if you haven't already, because 
there's so much to this story that's come out. And I know it's not like it's breaking news, but we've known that Arnold's going to be sat for a while, but it's it's definitely very significant news. So Adam Crafton said that Blanc, the former chief executive who left his high ranking role at Paris Saint-Germain last December, is, is expected to oversee the Arnold position long term. Richard Arnold is expected to make further changes after his Ratcliffe is expected to make further changes after his stake is ratified. And that's already started with Richard Arnold leaving United. And Sky Sports has said that Richard Arnold will leave United with immediate control. This has now been announced by Sky. It's now been announced by The Athletic. It's now been announced by the BBC. But I think the most interesting thing a lot of people are worrying are wondering is who's replacing Richard Arnold and why am I happy with the replacement? So he's not confirmed to be replacing Richard Arnold. It's not confirmed news, but this is the guy that at The Athletic, Sky Sports, every single source that has reliable information is saying is going to replace Richard Arnold. And this is John. Oh, no. Why do I keep sharing the wrong screen? I've got about 50 tabs open. I keep sharing the wrong screens. And this is Richard Arnold's replacement. John Claude Blanc. Uh, and I think he's very good as well. Adrian says Eric Tenog should go. I don't think Eric Tenog should go. Best form team in the league, people. <laughs> Best form team. No, I'm joking. But it doesn't feel like it. But who is the guy replacing Richard Arnold? Well, that's rumoured to be John Claude Blanc. There's a lot of fanfare behind the role of director of football being potentially filled by Paul Mitchell or Michael Edwards. We know that Paul Mitchell is probably coming in as director of football, but the role of CEO has been speculated to be filled by Frenchman John Claude Blanc. So who is he? He offers a bit of context about how Blanc started off his career at the Olympics marketing director, La Di Da, uh, had, you know, had started off his career in sport, <laughs> marketing, business, all of that. But then in 2009, he ended up at Turin. Now, when he went to Turin, Juventus were in the mud. Juventus were broke. Juventus had loads of debt. They were in the mud. And he basically went there um, in October 2009 and became chairman, but then later transitioned into the general manager and CEO in 2010. And when he was CEO of Juventus, they were in (coughs) arguably their worst period ever. Continue on. Blanc came into Juventus in the worst period ever. And what did he do? He rebuilt the team and technical staff. What needs to be done at United? Recruitment needs to be changed. Team needs to be changed. Staff needs to be changed. What did Blanc do at Juventus? That. What's he need to do at United? That. Blanc has experience of actually getting competent coaches to Juventus, competent recruitment to Juventus and rebuilding the team. He also not only rebuilt the team and helped with sporting success, he also helped with the financial health of the club, which, which was in massive debt. And he also supervised a new stadium project. What does Ratcliffe want? Ratcliffe wants the team to be rebuilt. Ratcliffe wants an overhaul of all the Manchester United staff, um, all the technical staff. Ratcliffe wants the financial health of the club to improve. He wants the debt to sort of go. And Ratcliffe wants to at least not build a new stadium, but renovate a stadium, which Blanc has experience doing. Richard Arnold had no experience being a CEO of a football club before he came to United. He was just a banker, a banker, that was friends with the Glazers. Blanc has experienced multiple experiences of being a competent and successful CEO of high ranking clubs. So what else about Blanc who's probably going to replace Arnold do we need to know? When he was at Juventus, his first order of business was to rebuild both the squad and backroom. He did so mainly by cutting down wages, something massively needed at United and shaking up the technical staff. What do Man United need? A big overhaul of staff, technical staff, medical staff, those at the top, those in recruitment. Boom, he did that at Juventus. And the wages to be cut. Boom, he did that at Juventus. He renegotiated contracts of stars and got rid of those demanding too much. So he massively cut down Juventus's wage bill. For stars that were sour, demanding too much money, he was like, no one's more powerful than the club. You're not worth this much money. Adios. And then he renegotiated contracts and actually got players to lower their wages and instill a sustainable structure in Juventus, something that is needed at Manchester United. Uh, By doing so, he'd aid his second objective, which was improving the financial health of the club. Juventus, just like Manchester United have been the last 10 years, were overspending on players and um, had ridiculous contracts on their books and debt to settle. What have Man United got? Debt to settle, overpaid players, 
um, and overspending to buy players in the transfer market. That's what Juventus were doing and to Blanc came in and helped improve their strength. Continuing on, Joel Cornblanc would um, manage to efficiently cut the debt Juventus owned, ultimately helping out the old lady gain their most consistent revenue stream compared to the rest of the Serie A. He gave them, um, not only did he help with football stuff on the pitch, but he gave Juventus a much more financial um, advantage to the rest of the league, which is why they basically dominated Serie A for about 10 years, remember? However, in order to sustain a, a, a sustain a stream of wealth, they needed to find a consistent source, which obviously came down to Juventus owning their stadium, which was a thing in Italy where a lot of clubs didn't own the stadium. Basically, he gave Juventus the upper hand um, over their rivals. Juventus then started to bring in more money. Uh, Juventus obviously got rid of the bad players, brought in the right staff, and they basically became the dominant sort of source, um, in, the dominant force in Serie A, bringing in Ronaldo among many things, not long after this. It was then said that Juventus <coughs> were the victims of this, um, blah, 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 blah. But we'll continue on as well. We're not too interested in the stadium and the financial side. We want to know about what he'll do on the footballing side. It was then said that Jean-Claude Blanc would leave the board of directors at Juventus in 2011, but he laid the foundations for Juventus to kick on. The season after he left was the first season in the Juventus stadium. They win the Scudetto for the first time in nine years, and we know what happened. So... What Blanc did at Juventus is he came into Juventus, he basically got rid of big name players, brought in new technical staff, completely reformed the wage bill, put some implementation in place so there was more financial health for the club, so they had a competitive advantage over rivals, and Juventus hadn't won the Scudetto in nine years. They went, they then went and won Scudetto for the first time in nine years as Blanc left, but Blanc laid the foundation for that to do that. And then, you know, the, the rest is history after that. They just, they just sort of won everything, brought in Ronaldo. You know that as well. After leaving Juventus, where did Blanc go? So this is more recent. Gone to Juventus, gone to PSG as well. Um, I'm just going to take a quick sip of water. Hmm. Alex said Blanc did quite well at Juventus, but he was part of a competent team with Morata and, yeah, 100%. Um, Morata, sorry. Um, I think that's what Jim Ratcliffe wants to do. I think that's why there's going to be three or four major sackings at United, because I think it's become very clear that Jim Ratcliffe wants to actually ha oversee a competent team of people at United. And I think that's why it's been said that, that Jim Ratcliffe hopes to make all of these major changes, bring in this change, bring in that change, because he, I think there'll be other people coming in on top of Blanc as well. With the public statement that the Glazers are in charge of comments, Blanc will sort out finances and Glazers will get the credit. Probably, but the Glazers will claim credit for anything that goes well at United, even though it's nothing to do with them as well. So after he left Juventus, he went to PSG. PSG owned by Qatar. So, you know, Qatar is probably would have brought someone like this in. Anyway, after leaving Turin, he went to PSG and his, more, his job at PSG was more marketing based than pitch based. But at PSG, essentially, he helped them win their first title in 19 years and mostly known for creating possibly the most marketable sports brand in the world while he was there. Not just helping things on the football side, but he was a very much a marketing genius, very much a business genius. Um, and PSG and Man City are two clubs that weren't super successful, then got taken over and are now dominant forces in Europe. But you see millions of PSG shirts, you don't see very many City shirts because PSG have almost become a brand, which Blanc was the sort of marketing director behind, um, just to give you context for that. He masterminded campaigns to advertise the club's image and it worked wonders. Whenever you walked up and down most cities in the world, if you aren't surprised seeing the PSG logo on someone's building, uh, someone or someone's building, if anything, you'd be shot. Um, and it's just because PSG is everywhere. And people will say, well, this has got nothing to do on the pitch. But what I'm saying is if you make Manchester United a more marketable brand, they bring in more money and there's more money to spend at the transfer window without FFP, blah, 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 blah. And then all of that as well. So the financial health of the club is important. It was then said he was the one that brokered the Jordan brand deal from PSG's side of things. And he um, is the brains behind Dior, Bape, Hublot, and all of these kind of stuff that happened at PSG. He almost made them like a fashion like PSG's kind of seen as a fashionable kit, kit as well fashionable kit as well do you know what I'm saying as well anyway after he did all that at Atom PSG and then did all that at Juventus he left and he joined Ineos Sport where he helped Jim Ratcliffe broker a potential bill to buy Man United and this is where we're talking about what is he going to do at United so he'd be the CEO of United replacing Richard Arnold 
His past roles show that he's more than capable. He's led the club in a greater crisis to glory in Juventus, and he's shown that he's a marking genius in Paris. Blend those experiences at United, you've got a recipe to success. And I agree with this. You've got someone that's financially competent, marketing confident, and you've got someone that can also show that he can improve things on the pitch, improve you know, the overhaul of the club, among many things as well. So what will he do when he comes to Manchester United? It was said that he'll look to exper experimentally eliminate the debt renovate Old Trafford and Carrington and cut down ridiculous wages from an internal perspective, which is massively needed. In terms of marketing, given a name like United, there, there'll obviously be lots to do because we're massive as well. He said, at the end of the day, John paul Blanc could be one of the greatest names United could get a CEO right now. He'd be a dream come true for most. So that was a really good thread I read that gives you everything that you need to know on Blanc, what he do at United, as well as among many things. Um, Alice, you're the best female content creator, even though we don't always agree. Big up Adrian as well. Uh, Blong's biggest contribution at PSG was more on the brand and commercial side. Footballing-wise, they just threw crazy money around. 100% agree. He's shown at Juventus he can do things on the footballing side. He's shown at PSG he can do things on the marketing side. I'm not saying that he's going to be the best CEO in the world, and I'm not saying that Blong's going to be this amazing, incredible thing for United. I'm not saying that any of that in the slightest, but what I'm saying is... The, the improvement from Blanc to Richard Arnold is massive. Like, obviously, anyone's an improvement on Richard Arnold, but you've got someone that's competent in terms of marketing, in terms of football stuff. You've got someone that is a lot more competent than Arnold. He's going to be better than Arnold, so will anyone. I don't. I think there's better CEOs out there. Of course there are, but I think, I think from a perspective of Paul Mitchell's a massive upgrade on John Murta, Blanc's a massive upgrade on Richard Arnold. You've got to look at it all from that kind of perspective. And it was said that it was Sergio Ratcliffe's decision to remove Richard Arnold from his position of club CEO because Ratcliffe wants a fresh approach. So it's already been confirmed that that is Ratcliffe's first decision. It is removing Richard Arnold. So fair play to Ragnar there because I think Richard Arnold needed to go. But it, Richard Arnold won't be the only person leaving Manchester United. There could be three, four, five major figures expected to leave Manchester United um, with John Murta expected next with Paul Mitchell coming in. I don't know if you watched my video yesterday, but there was a massive, massive story on Paul Mitchell that came out yesterday that I'm sure you guys have read. And it was basically said, so I get the story up as well. It was said that Paul Mitchell to Manchester United is really, really hot. That Doogie Friedman and Paul Mitchell are among the early contenders to come in, to, to come in and be United's next director of football under Sergeant Ratcliffe. Paul Mitchell was right at the top of the list to become Manchester United's next sporting director. Paul Mitchell to Manchester United could be expected in the coming weeks as Paul Mitchell wants Manchester United and Ratcliffe wants Paul Mitchell. Paul Mitchell can't be officially announced until Ineos' stake is officially announced. But by the fact that um, Arnold has been sacked and removed and that Murta is set to be sacked soon, it's expected that before January there will be an announcement that Paul Mitchell and Blanc could be the next two people coming in and joining Manchester United. Two, two massive moves as well. Um, somehow we still we we still been getting near record sponsorship deals as bad as we've been on the pitch. A competent CEO that that goes even further. And this is this is the thing. Look, we need the competent recruitment. We need a competent sporting director in Paul Mitchell, which I believe we're going to get. But also we need a competent CEO because if we're good on the pitch, if we're actually getting good commercial and financial and sponsorship success when we're crap with crap CEO. If we're good on the pitch with a good CEO, the amount of money United could generate is insane because people don't realise this. I wanted Qatar, I wanted a full sale. It wasn't that I wanted Qatar necessarily, it's that I wanted a full sale and Ratcliffe doesn't get you a full sale. But I will say this, you know, Man United is such a big club that they don't need Arab oil money to be successful because they generate so much money. They just need a competent owner that is willing to invest and, and have the club's sporting success as their best interest. Manchester City were a nothing club. They needed that oil money. Newcastle probably needed that oil money a bit more, but they're a semi-sized club. Clubs like Man United, Arsenal, Real Madrid, Barcelona, Liverpool, those five clubs, Bayern Munich as well, they're the type of clubs that would never need oil money to be successful because they are the biggest clubs in the world. They are so successful that all they need is a competent structure and the money they could generate is insane. Man City's owners can pump and pump and pump loads of money into Man City all they want. But if Man United won the treble, if Man United won the treble last season, we would have generated five, six times more money than Man City. When Man United is such a big brand. They are, they are the, got the biggest global fan base in the world. We are the biggest club in the world, you can say, in a, in a fan base size. We, I think the reason we just beat out the likes of, of Real Madrid in terms of predicted global fan base numbers is just because we're in the Premier League and more people speak English than Spanish. Um, I think that might give us a bit of an advantage there. 
But Manchester United have the biggest global fan base, expect of the 1.1 billion, because we are massive in Asia, and there's about 5 trillion people in Asia, it feels like. Absolutely massive. We have still been bringing in pretty much the most revenue in the league, despite not winning a league title in 10 years, and not winning a Champions League in 15 years, and being run by clowns. If Jim Ratcliffe brings in competent people, if Manchester United get back and become successful on the pitch, the money we can bring in is, is stuff that City couldn't potentially compete with if we were unsustainable. And I think people that don't realise that actually how big of a club that we are as well. Um, massive club as well. The Ratcliffe can also put his own money in for transfers too. I think he's allowed to add 20% of the club's turnover. Yeah. So there is talk about Ratcliffe doing a, what's it called? Uh, a big investment in the club because essentially what Ratcliffe can do is he can come into United and put an injection of cash into the cash into the January window and that wouldn't impact FFP. There is rumours and reports that Ratcliffe will come in in January and do like a 70 million cash injection, which would allow him to get round FFP this, FFP that. I don't know if Ratcliffe's going to come in and inject 70 million of his cash. But what we do know is that Ineos, I mean, Ineos is worth so much more than United. In Ineos net worth, what's Ineos is worth? Ineos' uh, estimated turnover is 59.3 billion. OK, um, Man United net worth, Manchester United's estimated turnover is 4.8 billion. So Ineos' expected turnover is 15 times higher than Man United's expected turnover. So the money that Ratcliffe will make from Ineos is, is um, so Man United's expected turnover is just under 5 billion. Ineos' Ineos expected turnover is 60 billion. The money that Ratcliffe makes from Ineos is a lot. People, people, look, I want a Qatar, I wanted a full sale, but I don't, I think people underestimate how rich Ratcliffe is. 60 million turnover from Ineos, 5 million, five, sorry, 60 billion turnover from Ineos, 5 billion turnover from Manchester United. <clears throat> He's not going to be using Manchester United to take out dividends. He can do that with Ineos. Ineos are 15 times richer than Manchester United. So he has the cash there from Ineos to inject into United. He has the um, he doesn't need to take money out of United um, as well. So I think that's something that a lot of people forget that Ratcliffe's intention isn't I'm going to become the Man United owner and take loads of money out of United. Ratcliffe's intention is, yes, I'm going to be chummy with the Glazers because I want to buy United and I don't have the money to compete with Qatar. So I'm doing it this way, which does feel a little bit of um, betrayal from Ratcliffe's part. You know, I'm a Man United fan, but I wanted to buy Chelsea. I'm happy to get in bed with the Glazers, all of that. But Ratcliffe has enough money with Ineos where he's not looking to make money out of United. His actual interest at United, according to lots of statements from reliable people, is to bring back the club's success. He wants to be known as a man that brings United back to success. Actions speak louder than words. We will judge Ratcliffe three years into his reign. He needs the two years of a settling in period, three, four years, and we judge Ratcliffe. We, we will judge Ratcliffe in 2027. And we will go... What's this PR? Is he another Glazer? Or was he trying to lay the foundations to make United successful again? I think sacking Arnold, bringing in Blanc, Paul Mitchell is a good start for Ratcliffe. But I do think, you know, he's not going to be another Glazer in the sense of, because a lot of people are saying Ratcliffe's worse than the Glazers. Ratcliffe is worse than Qatar. Ratcliffe's a lot worse than Qatar. Qatar would have brought 100% of the club. Qatar would have, you know, done loads of things that we needed to do. And the success with Qatar would have been a lot quicker. They would have brought 100% of the club. They would have built a new stadium. They would have cleared the debt. They would have done all of this. Ratcliffe is a downgrade on Qatar. And I think that's what, why there's a lot of negativity around Ratcliffe, because he is a significant downgrade on Qatar. But he is an upgrade on the Glazers. I see people calling him Rat Glazer. Look, he's a businessman. He's got into bed with the Glazers. I don't like that. But that is just that's his way of being smart to beat out Qatar and buy United. He doesn't need United to make money. He doesn't need United for dividends. He doesn't need any of that. He's got enough money with Ineos. And because he's got enough money with Ineos, his reported intention at United is generally about sporting success and obviously making the club more sustainable. Whereas the Glazers, theirs is just about making money out of United. Dividends, dividends, dividends. Ratcliffe is never going to need to take dividends out of United because Ineos, Ineos is, is 15 times reach, richer, which I think a lot of people don't quite speak about as well. Um a few people talking about David Gill. Yeah, well, David Gill was a big miss. And look, I think, you know, under Fergie was a miracle worker. I don't think the recruitment under Fergie was that good. I mean, let me think. Man United um, signings. Who do we sign in, in 2009? Like, I don't think the recruitment was particularly good under Fergie. I think David Gill worked well with Fergie. But in 2009, we signed Oberton. We signed Michael Owen. We signed Fraser Campbell. 
and we signed Scott Moffat. You know, our recruitment, I'm looking at United's recruitment over the years. I think our recruitment was shocking under Fergie. I just think Fergie was a miracle worker. The only good recruitment we did when we lost Ronaldo and we brought in Antonio Valencia for 18 million, which was good recruitment. Juve, which was crap. Overton, which was crap. And Owen, who was crap. Our recruitment was shocking. I'm looking at Man United's recruitment. Even when David Gill was here, it was crap. Like, since the day, Fergie was a miracle worker. You know, then the following season, we got Bebe, Chris Smalling, Chicharito and Andreas Lindegaard. We got brought into us in 2010-11. And this is why I always say, and I'll show you this now, this is why I hate it when people compare Fergie to Pep. The, 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 the recruitment that Fergie had to deal with. Look at this. You know, I hate it when people go compare Pep to Fergie. I'm like, no, Pep has had a competent structure. The reason you cannot compare Pep Guardiola and Ferguson is one, what Ferguson did at Aberdeen, and two, Pep Guardiola's had loads of competency around him. You look at the players that Manchester United signed. They lost Ronaldo here. Ronaldo they lost. And look, they bring in Valencia, Juve, Overton. I, 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 never, I, never, I never understood how shocking the recruitment was under Fergie. I think this was his last recruitment period here. This was good, Van Persie. Kigawa was crap. Zaha was crap. All of these were crap. Robin Van Persie. In, in Fergie's last five years, his only good signing was Robin Van Persie. Generally. I mean, unless I'm missing out someone obvious. 11-12, was there anyone good other than Van Persie that was signed? Oh, De Gea, I guess. De Gea, I guess. Um, Paul Scholes. Paul Scholes doesn't really count. Ashley Young was okay. Um... But the, the recruitment un, under under Fergie was was shocking at Manchester United. I think I think a lot of people don't realise how hard Fergie's job was, and um, I just think for me we've needed this for twenty years. We've needed someone like Paul Mitchell, someone that's competent at recruiting, to come in for twenty years. Because Bebe, Chris Smalling, Chicharito coming in, he he had he, in five years his only successful Man United signings were Robin Van Persie and De Gea. He lost Ronaldo, and in the five years after he lost Ronaldo. He won three league titles with basically no one good being brought in other than De Gea and Robin Van Persie. And then you wonder why Moyes took over and, and the bus crashed. Abs absolutely shocking the recruitment at United was. And, and that was the Glazers. They came in. Our best transfer winner under Fergie was 2003. Glazers came in in 2005 and it's, and it's been a shit show since. Absolute shit show since as well. My mum would make a better CEO than, <laughs> than Arnold, says Harv. I mean, I think United you know, have needed a good CEO for ages. It's not just Richard Arnold. There was Edward Wood, Matt Judge. Um, I just think we've been a big mess as well. Once the Glazers' influence fully took hold, a few years in, Gil felt the shackles. Yeah, I think Gil was a better. And then I think that's the worrying thing. The worrying thing is, look, Jim Ratcliffe's got sporting control. Jim Ratcliffe will have sporting control. That's what we're being told. And that's good. I'm happy that Jim Ratcliffe's got sporting control. That's needed to happen. But yeah, the worrying thing for me, and I think a lot of people, is more the fact that um, well, will Paul Mitchell and, Aunt, and Blanc be allowed to do what needs to be done? Richard G Gill went when the Glazers came in. Will How much freedom is, is, is um, Blanc going to get? How much freedom... Is Richard Arnold going to get? I think that is the thing. Um, I think that is what it is. That is the big problem. It's, okay, I'm happy that Paul Mitchell's coming in. I'm happy that Blanc's coming in. I think that these are good additions. I think these are things that are needed to happen at United. I want this to happen. I want that to happen. I want him in. I want, do you know what I mean? I want all of these things to happen. But the big question mark really for me is, okay, how, how well are they going to impact United? Are, are they going to be given the freedom to do this? Are they going to be given the freedom to do that? There's there's so many question marks around this potential signing and that as well. So Alex Ferguson worked miracles, but the league is way richer and more competitive up and down the table. Tough to na um, navigate as well in, in the current climate. 100%. Alex worked miracles. But it's mad to think that basically Sir Alex Ferguson was given no money. The Glazers basically used to go give Sir Alex Ferguson no money year after year after year because they knew that this guy was a miracle worker and would just win the league anyway. And then Sir Alex Ferguson used to go out and say, oh, there's no value in the market. There's no value in the market. There was plenty of value in the bloody market. But the Glazers used to throw the guy under the bus and be like, no, throw him under the bus, throw him under the bus. There's no value in the market. There's no value in the market. He was thrown 
under the bus by those Glazers so much. And I think he's, for me, what he did at Aberdeen, what he's done at United under the Glazers, the fact that no one and many competent managers are coming under the Glazers and they are, I think, a Sir Alex Ferguson, for me, will never not be the greatest manager in history. Pep Guardiola is a fantastic coach. Pep Guardiola's philosophy is probably better than Sir Alex's. But in terms of a manager, no one beats Sir Alex Ferguson for me. Now, there is a few more news stories coming out as well. Um, Paul Mitchell to United is very, very close. Uh, there's an expected to be an official announcement that Murta will leave later in the week as well, on top of Arnold, according to some sources. Patrick Stewart will not be the permanent Man United CEO, but he's taking over as of next week to replace Richard Arnold. Is coming up as well. And Sergio Rackler's first decision is sacking Richard Arnold, and Richard Arnold will not be the only guy that is being sacked. Um, Manchester legal counsel Patrick Stewart is now taking charge and John claude Blanc is in consideration to come in in the permanent. This change is much needed. United have obviously needed it. I saw a really interesting thread on Manchester United and, and, and the potential changes a good CEO could make. And we, we discussed that earlier in the video. So if you want to know about Blanc, who's going to, if you've just joined the live stream and you want to know all about Blanc, who's going to be the guy replacing Richard Arnold, scroll back to about five minutes into the live stream. We get into a lot of detail of that as well. Um, an interesting thing that was said was to underline not expecting any announcement on Ineos and Sergium today. Um, this it might take still up to six to eight weeks. Um, but uh, Richard Arnold is set to be sacked as well. Um, the thing is, uh, this is a Sergio Ratcliffe decision, but it still will take up to six to eight weeks. There's, there is that fear that um, it's going to be done right at the end of December, early January. So that is the fear ahead of the January transfer window as well. Now, I do want to get into a little bit of news as well on um, Jal Nevers at some point as well. Obviously, value in the market. Chelsea won nothing for decades until Roma and City were with mega investment. Yeah. Um, Fergie was an absolute genius. No other gaffer could win the league with Sir Alex Tykes the squad last season. Oh, honestly. So we, so we look at that. Man United squad um, 2012. Man United 2012. 2012. Um, 2013. I want, I want to get into this Jal Nevers story, but I want to show you this. I want to show you our actual squad that we played with. Um, okay, Man United. Let's do Man United versus Chelsea. Okay, who like what was Man United lineup? But oh, I can't find it. Man United versus Chelsea, twenty twelve. Damn it, twenty twelve thirteen lineup. I see if I can find it. Like the teams, the lineup that Fergie had. Um, yeah, I can find it here. Okay, here they are. I mean, you look at it, you look at Cleverly, you look at Anderson, you look at Wellback, you look at Young, you look at the players that would play for Manchester United and you think Ferguson won, won the league with a pivot of Cleverly and Anderson. He had the likes of Johnny Evans, he had the likes of Raphael that ended up not being that great. But, you know, Cleverly, um, Rio Ferdinand was getting on then, Ashley Young was okay. But he won the he won the league with players like Anderson, uh, Javier Hernandez, um, Nick Powell would be on the bench. He, you know that the <coughs> the miracles that Fergie produced, produced. Where's Arnold gone? He's leaving. He's leaving immediately. That that's what's been said. 2012-13. Some of those big names still were very much on the wane as well. Yeah, I mean, look, I think 2012-13 was sort of the end of Rio. The end of Evra, the end, the end of even people like Skulls were, were getting on. Gigs, did Gigs retire by them? When did Gigs retire? Did he retire with Fergie? Well, what year uh, did Gigs? I feel like I should know that. No, he, he retired the year after Fer Fergie, twenty fourteen. Um, I mean, Gigs was like forty when he retired. It felt like. Um, but like Giggs was 40 in his final season, Skulls was like 38, wasn't he, or something? Skulls was like 38 in his final season as well. Like Man United were getting by with like some 40 year olds in Fergie's final season as well. Clever Cleverly, Tom Cleverly, who just ended up not being a Premier League level player in the end, or a lower Premier League level player, was like was like McTominay. He was like the McTominay under um Sir Alex. He would play a lot. He would play an absolute lot as well. Uh, yeah, anyway, people, please do hit that like button, of course, subscribe down below if you're new, share the video and all of that stuff as well. I quickly want to get into 
the Jiao Nevers story because there's loads and loads to get into in regard to Jiao Nevers and um, I think we want to talk about it here. So Fabrizio Romano dropped a big, big story that Manchester United looking at midfielder Jiao Nevers. Now, if you don't know who Jiao Nevers is, absolute baller. Absolute baller, Jao Nevers is. Just one of those guys that you look at and he's he's a special talent and he probably won't end up at United because he's a special talent and he's going to be very, very expensive. But this was said on Jao Nevers. New, Manchester United sent scout to watch Benfica midfielder Jao Nevers play against Sporting CP on Sunday. United know the player well and are keeping an eye on him. Now, we know that United are looking at Anana of Everton. They're looking at Jao Nevers of Benfica. They're looking at Palacios of Bayer Leverkusen. They're also looking at Andre of um, Fluminense, Manchester United looking at a big range of midfielders. And I have to say, Jao Neves to Manchester United, I would be a big, big fan of that. I think he's an absolutely phenomenal player. I think he's got bags of potential. Um, but there's always the question of, do we develop Kobe Maynard? Do we go for Jao Neves? I would still like us to bring in someone a little bit more physical into the midfield. I think that that's what United need. I think United need someone physical. I think United need someone that can hold as a six that's physical, a long-term gas and rear replacement. If he's going to leave, they need an eight that can progress the ball. There's a lot of things that United need as well. But I think Jao Nevers definitely is one of those players that definitely going to be a special player. Probably going to end up at Real Madrid and, and, and do a Bellingham and be one of those other top players that Manchester United miss out on because that is our favourite thing to do missing out on top young players and i will do a video if we get linked to jao nevers more because the fact that fabrizio romano is linking us to jao nevers shows that we are generally interested in jao nevers we were linked to jao nevers in the summer we've been linked to jao nevers all season but now romano is saying look man united are seriously interested in this jao nevers guy la di da <coughs> la di da la di da so we obviously know that we want jao nevers if we get more information on Jao Neves, United's plans for Jao ne Neves, this and that, I will 100% do a video analysing Jao Neves and what he would bring to United. But the reason I just don't give the chance for news too much attention right now is there's so much uncertainty right now um, with what our targets are. We some say, like we want a right back, two centre backs, we want two midfielders, we want a right wing, we want a striker. Are we going to bring them all in? Is Casemiro leaving? Is Varane leaving? Are we going to need to replace this player? We're going to need to replace that player. Martial leaving. Potentially Anthony can leave. Uh, Sancho will go. How much money are we going to get without? What's the budget? How much can Sergio interject into United? There's so many question marks of what, about what can United do recruitment rise. But as Shokat Khan has said, the core problem at Manchester United is the Glazers. And we know uh, we've got some update, actually. <laughs> we've got some update on the Glazers leaving United because the Glazers will leave Man United is what's being said. The Glazers will leave Manchester United, but they will be here for another three years is what's being said. Sergio Ratcliffe will own 69% of Manchester United within the next two to three years is what is being said. Hopefully that is the case because, look, Sergio Macri comes in, he owns 25%. He brings in Blanc, he brings in Mitchell, brilliant. But Blanc and Mitchell will still have the glazes above them just to, to kind of, you know, holding them back a bit. Blanc and Mitchell might have to work for a year and a half with the Glazers above them, holding them back. Once Sergio Macliff in three years by 69% of the club, hopefully he would give Blanc and Mitchell the freedom to operate this club well. And that's why I say we will judge Ratcliffe's reign in 2027. Was Ratcliffe just PR? Uh, was Ratcliffe another Glazer or was Ratcliffe the guy who, who he wants to be that changed United? And it was said by Simon Stone that there will be a gap of six to eight weeks between the announcement of the Ratcliffe deal and confirmation by the Premier League, during which time the British billionaire will be unable to contribute to club operations, which is why there's a big question mark around the January transfer window, because by the time Ratcliffe is actually in United, it could be January 29th and he's got two days to do something in the January transfer window, which... Yeah, isn't looking good, isn't looking good. But anyway, I'm going to wrap up the live stream here. So please do hit that like button. Of course, subscribe down below. I'm going to redirect you to never a foul stream. See you next time. Bye.